for those online. My computer just crashed, so I apologize about that. We're back up and running and starting starting up the processes again. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and get this video playing. So again, the point of this um, video really is uh, to kind of talk a little bit about why that persuasion matters, why good communication matters, why we want to um, be good at communicating. And that's actually not his topic exactly, but I'm using it because it's also relevant to our class. And I think that um, the relevance here is that this talk is called When Ideas Have Sex. So got a sexy topic for you as well. That's always fun. So, uh, without further ado, I'm going to let him talk. This is 15 minutes or so. He's the author of a book I've recommended already once already. Well, that's actually two. Uh, more recently, How Innovation Works, just kind of most of what he's talking about here. And then The Rational Optimist back um, in 2010, which is probably his source material for this um, for this talk here. Okay, so I'm going to set this up. I'll mute myself so it's not double double audio for those online, and uh, enjoy. things happen. And astonishingly, if you look at what actually happened, in my lifetime, the average per capita income of the average person on the planet, in real terms, adjusted for inflation, has trebled. Lifespan is up by 30% in my lifetime. Child mortality is down by two thirds. Per capita food production is up by a third. And all this at a time when the population has doubled. How did we achieve that? Whether you think it's a good thing or not, how did we achieve that? How did we become the only species that becomes more prosperous as it becomes more populous? The size of the blob in this graph represents the size of the population, and the level of the graph represents GDP per capita. I think to answer that question, you need to understand how human beings bring together their brains and enable their ideas to combine and recombine, to meet and indeed to mate. In other words, you need to understand how ideas have sex. <laughs> I want you to imagine how we got from making objects like this to making objects like this. <laughs> These are both real objects. One is an Ashwellian hand axe from half a million years ago of the kind made by Homo erectus. The other is obviously a computer mouse. They're both exactly the same size and shape to an uncanny degree. I've tried to work out which is bigger and they're not. And it's, it's almost impossible. And that's because they're both designed to fit the human hand. They're both technologies. In the end, their similarity is not that interesting. It just tells you they were both designed to fit the human hand. The differences are what interest me because the one on the left was made to a pretty unvarying design for about a million years, from one and a half million years ago to half a million years ago. Homo erectus made the same tool for 30,000 generations. Of course, there were a few changes, but tools changed slower than skeletons in those days. There was no progress, no innovation. It's an extraordinary phenomenon, but it's true, whereas the object on the right is obsolete after five years. And there's another difference, too, which is the object on the left is made from one substance. The object on the right is made from a confection of different substances, from silicon and metal and plastic and so on. And more than that, it's a confection of different ideas, the idea of plastic, the idea of a laser, the idea of transistors. They've all been combined together in this technology. And it's this combination, this, this cumulative technology that intrigues me, because I think it's the secret to understanding what's happening in the world. 
My body's an accumulation of ideas too. The idea of skin cells, the idea of brain cells, the idea of liver cells, they've come together. How does evolution do cumulative combinatorial things? Well, it uses sexual reproduction. In an asexual species, if you get two different mutations in different creatures, a green one and a red one, then one has to be better than the other, one goes extinct for the other to survive. But if you have a sexual species, then it's possible for an individual to inherit both mutations from different lineages. So what sex does is it enables the individual to draw upon the genetic innovations of the whole species. It's not confined to its own lineage. What's the process that's having the same effect in cultural evolution as sex is having in biological evolution? And I think the answer is exchange. The habit of exchanging one thing for another. It's a unique human feature. No other animal does it. You can teach them in the laboratory to do a little bit of exchange, and indeed there's reciprocity in other animals, but the exchange of one object for another never happens. As Adam Smith said, no man ever saw a dog make a fair exchange of a bone with another dog. <laughs> you can have culture without exchange. You can have, as it were, asexual culture. Chimpanzees, killer whales, these kind of creatures, they have culture. They teach each other traditions, which are handed down from parent to offspring. This, in this case, chimpanzees teaching each other how to crack nuts with rocks. But the difference is that these cultures never expand, never grow, never accumulate, never become combinatorial. And the reason is because there is no sex, as it were. There is no uh, exchange of ideas. Chimpanzee troops have different cultures in different troops. There's no exchange of ideas between them. And why does exchange raise living standards? Well, the answer came from David Ricardo in 1817. And here's a Stone Age version of his story, although he told it in terms of trade between countries. Adam takes four hours to make a spear and three hours to make an ax. Oz takes one hour to make a spear and two hours to make an ax. So Oz is better at both spears and axes than Adam. He doesn't need Adam. He can make his own spears and axes. Well, no, because if you think about it, if Oz makes two spears and Adam makes two axes, and then they trade, then they will each have saved an hour of work. And the more they do this, the more true it's going to be. Because the more they do this, the better Adam is going to get at making axes, and the better Oz is going to get at making spears. So the gains from trade are only going to grow. And this is one of the beauties of exchange, is it actually creates the momentum for more specialization, which creates the momentum for more exchange and so on. Adam and Oz both saved an hour of time. That is prosperity, the saving of time in satisfying your needs. Ask yourself how long you would have to work to provide for yourself an hour of reading light this evening to read a book by. If you had to start from scratch, let's say you, you go out into the countryside, you find a sheep, you kill it, you get the fat out of it, you render it down, you make a candle, etc., etc. How long is it going to take you? Quite a long time. How long do you actually have to work to earn an hour of reading light if you're on the average wage in Britain today? And the answer is about half a second. Back in 1950, you would have had to work for eight seconds on the average wage to acquire that much light, and that's seven and a half seconds of prosperity that you've gained since 1950, as it were, because that's seven and a half seconds in which you can do something else or you can acquire, acquire another good or service. And back in 1880, it would have been 15 minutes to earn that amount of light on the average wage. Back in 1800, you'd have had to work six hours to earn a candle that could burn for an hour. In other words, the average person on the average wage could not afford a candle in 1800. Go back to this image of the axe and the mouse and ask yourself who made them and for who. The stone axe was made by someone for himself. It was self-sufficiency. We call that poverty these days. But the object on the right was made for me by other people. How many other people? Tens, hundreds, thousands? You know, I think it's probably millions because you've got to include the man who grew the coffee, which was brewed for the man who was on the oil rig, who was drilling for oil, which was going to be made into the plastic, etc. They were all working for me, to make a mouse for me. And that's the, that's the way society works. That's what uh, we've achieved as a species. In the old days, if you were rich, you literally had people working for you. That's how you got to be rich. You employed them. Louis XIV had a lot of people working for him. They made his silly outfits like this, and they, made his, <laughs> and they did his silly hairstyles or whatever. He had 498 people to prepare his dinner every night. But a modern tourist going around the Palace of Versailles and looking at Louis XIV's pictures, he has 498 people doing his dinner tonight too. They're in bistros and cafes and restaurants and shops all over Paris, and they're all ready to serve you at an hour's notice with an excellent meal that's probably got 
higher quality than Louis XIV even had. And that's what we've done. Because we're all working for each other, we're, we were able to, to draw upon specialization and exchange to raise each other's living standards. Now, you do get other animals working for each other, too. Ants are a classic example. Workers work for queens, and queens work for workers. But there's a big difference, which is that it only happens within the colony. There's no working for each other across the colonies. And the reason for that is because there's a reproductive division of labor. That is to say, they specialize with respect to reproduction. The queen does it all. In our species, we don't like doing that. It's the one thing we insist on doing for ourselves, is reproduction. <laughs> Even in England, we don't <laughs> leave reproduction to the queen. So when did this habit start, and how long has it been going on, and what does it mean? Well, I think probably the oldest version of this is probably the sexual division of labor, but I've got no evidence for that. It just looks like the first thing we did was work male for female and female for male. In all hunter-gatherer societies today, there's a foraging division of labor between, on the whole, hunting males and gathering females. It isn't always quite that simple, but there's a, there's a, there's a distinction between specialized roles for males and females. And the beauty of this system is that it benefits both sides. The woman knows that in the Hadza's case here, digging roots to share with men in exchange for meat, she knows that all she has to do to get access to protein is to dig some extra roots and trade them for meat. And that she doesn't have to go on an exhausting hunt and try and kill a warthog. And the man knows that he doesn't have to do any digging to get um, roots. All he has to do is make sure that when he kills a warthog, it's big enough to share some. And so both sides raise each other's standards of living through the sexual division of labor. When did this happen? We don't know, but it's possible that Neanderthals didn't do this. They were a highly cooperative species. They were a highly intelligent species. Their brains, on average, by the end, were bigger than yours and mine in this room today. Uh, they were imaginative. They buried their dead. They had language, probably, because we know they had the FOXP2 gene of the same kind as us, which was discovered here in Oxford. And so it looks like they probably had linguistic skills. They were brilliant people. I'm not dissing the Neanderthals. But they... <laughs> But there's no evidence of a sexual division of labor. There's no evidence of gathering behavior by females. It looks like the females were cooperative hunters with the men. And the other thing there's no evidence for is exchange between groups. Because the objects that you find in Neanderthal remains, the, the tools they made, are always made from local materials. For example, in the Caucasus, there's a site where you find local Neanderthal tools. They're always made from local chert. In the same valley, there are modern human remains from about the same date, 30,000 years ago. And some of those are from local chert, but, more, but many of them are made from obsidian from a long way away. And when human beings began moving objects around like this, it was evidence that they were exchanging between groups. Trade is 10 times as old as farming. People forget that. People think of trade as a modern thing. Exchange between groups has been going on for 100,000 years. And this, the earliest evidence for it crops up somewhere between 80 and 120,000 years ago in Africa when you see obsidian and jasper and other things moving long distances in Ethiopia. You also see these seashells, as discovered by a team here in Oxford, moving 125 miles inland from the Mediterranean in Algeria. And that's evidence that people have started exchanging between groups, and that will have led to specialization. How do you know that long-distance movement means trade rather than migration? Well, you look at modern hunter-gatherers like aboriginals who quarried stone axes at a place called Mount Isa, which was a quarry owned by the Kalkadun tribe. They traded them with their neighbors for things like stingray barbs. And the consequence was that stone axes ended up over a large part of Australia. So long-distance movements of tools is a sign of trade, not migration. What happens when you cut people off from exchange, from from the, the ability to exchange and specialize? And the answer is that not only do you slow down technological progress, you can actually throw it into reverse. An example is Tasmania. When the sea level rose and Tasmania became an island 10,000 years ago, the people on it not only experienced slower progress than, than people on the mainland, they actually experienced regress. They gave up the ability to make stone tools and fishing equipment and clothing because the population of about 4,000 people was simply not large enough to maintain the specialized skills necessary to keep te the technology they had. It's as if the people in this room were plonked on a desert island. How many of the things in our pockets could we continue to make after 10,000 years? It didn't happen in Tierra del Fuego. Similar island, similar people, 
The reason, because Tierra del Fuego is separated from South America by a much narrower strait, and there was trading contact across that strait throughout 10,000 years. The Tasmanians were isolated. Go back to this image again and ask yourself not only who made it and for who, but who knew how to make it? In the case of the stone axe, the man who made it knew how to make it. But who knows how to make a computer mouse? Nobody. Literally nobody. There is nobody on the planet who knows how to make a computer mouse. <laughs> I mean this quite seriously. The president of the computer mouse company doesn't know. He just knows how to make a, uh, run a company. The person on the assembly line doesn't know because he doesn't know how to drill an oil well to get oil out to make plastic, and so on. We all know little bits, but none of us knows the whole. I am, of course, quoting from a famous essay by Leonard Reed, the economist in the 1950s, called I Pencil, in which he wrote about how a pencil came to be made and how nobody knows even how to make a pencil because the people who assemble it don't know how to mine graphite and, the, and they don't know how to fell trees and that kind of thing. And what we've done in human society through exchange and specialization is we've created the ability to do things that we don't even understand. It's not the same with language. With language, we have to transfer ideas that we understand with each other. But with, with technology, we can actually do things that are beyond our capabilities. We've gone beyond the capacity of the human mind to an extraordinary degree. And by the way, that's one of the reasons that I'm not interested in the debate about IQ, about whether some groups are, have higher IQ than other groups. It's completely irrelevant. What, what, what's relevant to a society is how well people are communicating their ideas and how well they're cooperating, not how clever the individuals are. So we've created something called the collective brain. We're just the nodes in the network. We're the neurons in this brain. It's the interchange of ideas, the meeting and mating of ideas between them that is causing technological progress incrementally, bit by bit, however bad things happen. And in the future, as we go forward, we will, of course, experience terrible things. There will be wars, there will be depressions, there will be natural disasters. Awful things will happen in this century, I'm absolutely sure. But I'm also sure that because of the connections people are mating and the ability of ideas to, m to meet and to mate as never before, I'm also sure that technology will advance and therefore living standards will advance. Because through the cloud, through crowdsourcing, through the bottom-up world that we've created, where not just the elite, elites, but everybody is able to have their ideas and make them meet and mate, we are surely accelerating the rate of innovation. Thank you. Okay. What do you guys think? Did you enjoy that? You, uh, did you find it a compelling argument as to why communication is important? So, I, in fact, I, it had been a long time since I had seen that, or maybe I never even walked through that myself the whole way. Um, so, I, the fact that he really said exactly what I was wanting to say myself was really kind of cool there at the end <laughs> uh, about communication of ideas. Um, Okay, so, uh, and by the way, that it's kind of an interesting tangent here. So all of that kind of hopeful messaging about technology, progress, things like that, um, there's, there's something that's a little bit counter to that that is, let's say, a uh, dramatization of the, the rural or the um, self, uh, what is it, the, the self-provision lifestyle. There's something... I think in base humanity that appreciates that um, the lifestyle is disconnected to the technology, They're the um, self-subsistence, sub subsistence living sort of thing. Um, and sometimes there's movements towards that end, um, even, even to the point where they kind of feel religious that division of labor is bad, that's sort of like if you were to think about Marxist theories, it's sort of a religion in their premises that division of labor is bad. So we're all going to be happy if we're able to be in small groups that are self-subsistent like that. Um, I, I think this makes an excellent case kind of counter to that, but that's not to say it's not a beautiful thing to go out in nature and maybe 
go backpacking or camping or something to really experience uh, nature in that manner. So just be be thoughtful about that if you encounter uh, movements that are pushing towards everything human is bad and nature is good because there is a dynamic there and we we have to value humanity, right? The, the reason we care about the environment has to be rooted in human desires and needs. So if you can't ethically go against humanity in that. So this then is a very positive and hopeful message in that we can have human flourishing and more and more technologies and capabilities to care for the environment at the same time. Um, okay, so anyway, tangent there. Um, so good communication then increases opportunity. Bad communication or lack of communication uh, legitimately leads to poverty, as he was talking about. In, in his book, um, he talks more about um, the, the communities there, and literally they lost the ability, the know-how to make certain tools, and therefore they used to be able to, uh, I think it was do some farming in addition to the fishing and on that island, and the fossil history shows that eventually it was only fishing and then it became more primitive fishing than they used to be able to do because that knowledge was not passed down, it was not, they didn't have the resources, things like that. So they really became um, in worse poverty, we'll say, than they were um, before, before they were separated. So quite, quite interesting there. Okay, uh, last thing I'll say about just general persuasiveness, it's in everybody's best interest. Right. If you have to sit here and listen to me because you're paying to get a degree and all that, I might as well be persuasive and interesting and engaging for you so that you have a little bit of, of a better time with it. Right? Uh, you can notice that about any of your classes you take. If there's just no attention to persuasion, if there's no thought to engagement with the audience or anything like that, you probably aren't going to love the class, or at least it's going to be less nice of a class as if it was, maybe you love the topic, but it just is kind of a bore, right? That happens. Um, and sometimes that's me. Sometimes I don't prepare well enough, or it's something I just have not given enough energy to, and it's just going to be kind of a flat lecture. I apologize when that happens, or for, for the case when that happens. But if you're sitting here, and you're talking in front of the class, you might as well give it a shot at being a little extra persuasive, because all your peers have to sit here and listen to you, right? Or, or whenever you do give a, any sort of a uh, talk of any kind. Okay. All right, so then on to a few presentation tips. Um, and the first I'm going to say is really be aware of nerves. And when I say be aware, recognize that anybody standing up in front of a lot of people, there's going to be some nerves involved. That's common. You're kind of weird if that doesn't happen whatsoever. Um, maybe you get used to it, maybe I get used to it, and then I can stand up here and be like, oh, hi guys, you know, how's it going? But there's still almost always something in me that's like, oh, now I have to like deal with all of this attention, and you know, do I know what I'm planning to say? Did I, you know, what's going on? There's usually something there in, in your human nature that's, that's going to have some nerves. So just the fact that that is normal is helpful. So I could probably trigger a lot of you into some, some anxiety just by showing you the Google search of public speaking. Right? So you start looking at these slides, these pictures, and there's all sorts of like, you know, this, this dude up here in the top left looks really nervous, um, you know, looks like a photo that's been used multiple times for this topic, and you see like the, the pictures of the crowds, something in you, if you look closely, might start feeling a little, a little nervous, right? Um, so just accept that that's going to be somewhat of a feature of talking in front of people, talking to a lot of people. And then build some habits to deal with that, right? So what I mean by that is if you, if you establish some muscle memory um, with a little bit of practice to when you greet your audience, maybe step forward a little bit, stand up straight, put your shoulders back a little bit, that will tend to have, give you more confidence and give you a better feel for how to engage with your audience. So there's a few things like that I want to just uh, mention. I don't always do a great job with those things when I'm lecturing, in part because I'm trying to stay in camera enough, and if I was giving the camera the attention that um, the uh, audience online deserves, I would be sitting here like this and kind of ignoring some of the rest of the room. So I, it's a little bit of a balance here, and it, it doesn't help that 
I'm not using my webcam camera either because that means that uh, when I'm looking at my slides, it's not, <laughs> I'm not even giving them the attention to uh, So anyway, things like that, build a few habits, be thinking about it when you're going to present on Wednesday, even though it's just going to be, you'll stand up, I would encourage you to stand up and come to the front of the room, maybe if you're in the kind of corner of the class or something, maybe just stand up, but there's a few things you ought to do for any audience, anytime you're engaging with an audience. Uh, so because you're going to be nervous, take a deep breath before you begin, it's a good idea. Recognize that it's okay if there are pauses, for example. You're now hanging on my words, waiting for me to say the next thing because it sounds like it's going to be important because I have a pause there. Um, so if you can stand up and speak, kind of assert your voice to the room, I tend to be pretty quiet natured, so if I just start talking in my shy voice or like my, you know, uh, my voice that I would have inside, those of you in the back are probably like, speak up a little, <laughs> you know, have a hard time hearing me. So be attentive to that. If you have to, if your audience has to listen to you or is being subject to your talk, you might as well allow them to hear you, right? So that would be a good thing to do. Okay, so a few specifics on posture. I, I mentioned already having your shoulders back, um, stuff like that. The, you'll even hear if you're like in preparation to go give a big talk and kind of in a private room or something, if you put your arms up, kind of like the victory pose or something like that, that actually triggers some, some chemicals in your body to feel more positive and to feel more um, capable. So slouching then and kind of doing the reverse sort of types of things are going to do exactly the opposite and make you feel even less capable, less uh, and more shy, things like that. So a lot of, a lot of these things are fake, fake your own body out so that you can have a decent time of giving talk. So, uh, in addition to kind of posture up here, the other thing I would say, when you get up to talk to somebody, start planted. I've been wandering around a lot. A lot of good lecturers do wander some, but when you start, at least, and it's fine if you stay in the same spot. I try to stay kind of in the same spot for the camera, but what you want to do is make sure that your feet, at least, that you, you want to encompass your audience with them almost at all times. So I don't know if you can see my feet, but I'm, I'm going to be pointing one at this side of the audience and one out here. And what that's going to do is keep my, my hips open, which will keep kind of my presence towards you. So let's say I want to talk about my slides. It'd be great if I kept this foot angled something towards that side of the room so that you don't get this action where I'm supposedly talking to you but it's immediately clear to you that you no longer have my attention if I do this, right? Or even if I'm doing this. It still feels like, why, why are you doing this? Like, why are you talking to me like that? Um, can you pay attention to me? I'm, I'm the one listening here. So you'll see this and, you know, of course, you can critique various uh, teachers and, and all that all the time. What I want for you to do, is, especially once you get to the slides, be attentive to that. Yes, sometimes it makes sense to point something out. But no, your audience does not care so much about your slides. You didn't do that great of a job on any of them. And to warrant the amount of attention that you are actually supposed to be getting for yourself. Right? So you are the, the audience's target. They're going to care about you and what you have to say. The slides are just kind of a side note that they're going to supplement that. And in that way, I would say, um, as a presenter, you are there to serve the audience to a large extent. You're going to give them knowledge, you're going to give them the info, you're taking their time, use it use it wisely, and treat treat them accordingly. Another thing, good thing to do is to greet the audience. Uh, again, my introverted self, I don't do a great job chatting with you guys before class begins, I'm usually running a little late and trying to start up the, the stream and all that, but I do at least try to have some sort of a hello at the start of class, and especially when guys are talkative, that's kind of helpful. I don't just go straight into, okay guys, and here's sedimentation without without some sort of a greeting, right? So on Wednesday, what I'd like for you guys to do is to first say, hi, my name is Sam. Uh, I'm going to talk about this. So train 
you know, and practice just that little bit is going to help. Um, you know, you can memorize a couple sentences that sound halfway decent, so that you know exactly how you're going to start, and that will help everything. And of course, for the uh, probably like a one-minute talk you're going to give on Wednesday, you could memorize the whole thing, I'm sure, but. Um, it, it may be a good idea to have an exact reading in mind, say, you know, um, so and then and then to practice just that hello. Okay, a few more things. I kind of did mention the attention, but just bear in mind that attention is the commodity when you are presenting. So actually, that we already covered all of that. That was that. Was, okay, uh, a few things about clarity. So. Uh, maybe some of you do not have English as your first language. Maybe some of you have uh, maybe a stutter or something. Maybe you're shy. Maybe you're just very quiet. Maybe you're naturally loud. Um, in which case, reverse may apply a little bit here. Um, but clarity generally goes a long way. If your audience can hear you, then they can actually decide whether or not they're bored. If they can't hear you, they're going to be bored, and even if they maybe could have been interested, right? So. If you, uh, especially if you start off quiet, you won't capture that attention. I mentioned that. So the first few words, if you make sure to project those, it's going to build your own confidence. So for example, if I walk up here and say, "Hi guys, how you doing?" You know, already lost, losing some attention. I have like, okay, what, what is he talking about? Whereas if I say, "Well, good noon to you," it's already some sort of engaging. Capturing the presence. Um, if I uh, if I gesturing, I don't think I wrote this anywhere, but gesturing can be a good thing and can be a bad thing. If you're fidgeting with your your hands a lot, if you're you know, not sure where to put them, and you know just doing gestures that are not really thoughtful can be a bad thing. And it can oftentimes feel like it's going to be distracting if you're making big gestures. Turns out. I don't really do a good job at it, and I myself have good reason to think like, oh, I've got freakishly long arms, like, this is going to be weird if I gesture large. But most people apparently actually appreciate it if you're, um, if you extend yourself, if you make yourself present because you're taking the attention anyway, and if I'm a gesture about something, I don't know, you guys tell me, is it, is it weird if I do this, like, have my, my full arm span out, <laughs> or does it feel actually kind of natural? It's like casual, like, honestly, it looks like you're pointing something Oh, yeah. So, and, and that's that's the point, right? Thank you. It, it, that's the goal, right? I don't want to just always sit here like this, kind of like I do. Um, but if I if I can capture your attention, especially make the highlight an important spot, it's it's okay. And if, if I can do that without it being awkward, I promise you, you can too. So, it, especially if you are have some intention about it, and it's not just fidgety kind of thing, that that's a good thing. Another thing you can practice in front of a mirror, right? A lot, of, a lot of presentation habits, you could just spend a few minutes in front of a mirror, feel so awkward, but recognize that it's not going to be awkward to the recipients. Okay, coming back to enunciating, um, especially if you, if you know that you are quiet, if you're not as comfortable with uh, English or you know, have any, any things like that, a lot of times opening your mouth wide will help. If I, if I sit here and talk with my mouth closed or, or close, even if I'm talking loud, it's still going to be a little bit less clear as when I open my mouth wide. And again, it might feel very awkward. I'm like intentionally doing it, and it's feeling awkward to me. But I'm al also noticing all of my words are coming out a lot more clear than when I do it like this. Right? So be aware these shy habits, these natural. Um, tendencies for your body to react to a nervous situation will make the situation worse. So just build a few habits to at least start off that way and see how far it carries, right? Don't think about it too much. Just practice a little bit, get a few muscle memory habits in there, and then um, it, should, it should go a long way. Okay, I mentioned this once, but if you think about the awkward moments of silence, worried about that, perhaps you uh, speak a mile a minute, like some people do, you might be very worried to have a pause, so you fill it uh, with something 
you know, I, I think um, maybe I, I, I might not be as clear if I, if I don't express my uh, uh, thought. Whereas, if I think about it, and I just let the pause hang there sometimes, have lots more attention from you just for the pauses. So even if I need a moment to think about what I'm saying next, it's actually not a bad thing, right? And that quality, the quality there of those two little sound bites I just gave you is, is pretty amazing. And I should practice it more myself, intentionally having the pauses, because I, you know, just now I'm like seeing it in action and like, I keep your, I keep your attention when I pause. It's just kind of a, another one of those natural things to do. Again, um, you end up triggering kind of the psychology of your listeners. They want to hear what you have to say if you're speaking with such intent that you have pauses, I guess. Okay, think about the uh, conversations, the talks, presentations, whatever, as a dialogue with your audience. Maybe you are just telling me about some particular case study. But it ought to occur like a dialogue. So today, usually what I try to do is make eye contact. You might think that's awkward when you're talking, and it could be awkward if I just like stared at one person for like five minutes and like emphasized it and didn't break eye contact. Yeah, that I could be awkward, right? But I'm not meaning to do that. Nobody's gonna be meaning to do that. And so good to have eye contact rest for a few seconds, maybe a phrase, maybe a full sentence. I don't, you know, I'm probably too shy, I don't quite do a full sentence. Um, but that that technically would be like having a conversation. We could have a moment where we connect and I see like, how interested are you? Are you, you know, something something for me to practice on. Um, and that goes a long way to keeping with your eye audience and uh, can make it like a dialogue. Okay, finally, you have to know something about your topic. Kind of obvious, but if you don't know anything, it becomes very clear, so yeah, that's. But that's part of talking about something, right? You have to have some frame of reference to be able to talk about it. But take comfort in that, too, because if you're doing some sort of research, doing a project, chances are you've been thinking a lot about it, so you have some things to talk about it, and you will, those will come out in a dialogue type of form. All right, any, any questions on, or comments, tips you've heard on uh, presentation stuff? Do you find that somewhat helpful, or a little entertaining, maybe? Hopefully. Have you, have you seen that episode of Seinfeld? you watch Seinfeld? I don't, I don't oh, watch Seinfeld. <laughs> well, like, Jerry, like, starts the episode, like, people are more afraid of public speaking than death. And, like, he's <laughs> like, Public speaking ranks number one. <laughs> and like, that's what, like being scared of death. And like when I start talking, it made me think of it. <laughs> Pu public fear number one. Public yeah. <laughs> I don't know if it's actually true. It, it could be. As much as I like, trust Jerry Seinfeld, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Just think of the ideas. They need to have sex too, okay? <laughs> All right. Okay, so uh, in terms of writing, We'll get to an uh, end note in just a couple minutes. Um, for your intros and for really writing in general, this also touches on communicating with uh, oral like presentation type stuff. But um, if you take any anything you want to communicate, it's almost always going to be some argument or some, you know, even if it's just some information you're trying to convey, Really what you're doing is you're making an argument that, hey, this information is important, and here it is. So most of the time when we're doing some sort of a written communication or your papers to me are essentially going to be you making some form of an argument. Uh, that's what I would like anyway. So we, we think about our high school English class as an argumentative essay kind of thing. The simplest form of an argument, at least in kind of the, the English Western culture, is to make an assertion and to back it up with evidence. So think assertion, evidence. I say I made the comment about English language and Western culture because the English language is set up in such a way, our grammar is such that that's usually how it flows when we're talking or writing. Um, technically, you can 
reverse some things, you can reverse the sentence structure and things, but um, most of the time it makes the most sense to say, I think you guys should learn this technique because it helps you write better. So I just made an assertion and gave some evidence or claims of some evidence, right? Um, perhaps that's <laughs> in a way too assertion, but that's a good way to write, especially for a technical paper. I, I also mentioned the culture aspect because when I was a graduate student, I had a, a peer, a colleague who was, um, was a bit older than me, is a, from Korea, and he had, we had fascinating conversations about linguistics and all sorts of stuff, even outside research, and he would tell me that, yeah, in, in his culture, a lot of times you would build up several evidences and then make your assertion claim. And so when he was adapting to writing uh, research papers in English and even kind of communicating in this realm, he had to remind himself that, okay, let's put the assertion first, here's what I am asserting, and then back that up with evidence. So I don't, you know, it may be something that there are um, cultural expectations, so just be, be thinking about that if that applies to you, to think about, okay, how to structure, typically, just be very clear about what your assertion is, and then follow that with the evidence. So when we talk about writing a research paragraph, like a, a research paper, that first paragraph, perhaps, is going to give, um, usually, your assertion in there. Because what I'm kind of expecting for you, for you to do is to give me context and then that thesis statement is your assertion. So it's early on in your paper, a little context to know why we care about it, and then the rest of the paper is going to be evidence. So I'll just call this, uh, I guess, content here. And then if you had some sort of a conclusion that yeah, could be a spot to hammer home um, like the uh, really why your evidence supports that assertion. So it's a good spot to tie those back together. Okay, so when you're thinking about that intro statement, uh, the intro paragraph, also due on Wednesday, think about what are you asserting? You know, maybe you just selected the topic because it sounded cool, um, sounded interesting, well, you're going to have to do enough research to, to make some kind of a, an argument, to make some sort of a statement about that topic. So um, maybe you're thinking about Haiti, and you're thinking about the cholera epidemic in Haiti, and so you know maybe you're going to assert that the UN uh, peace workers, the, um, the aid workers, are all evil and bad. So maybe that's your, that's your assertion. <laughs> You're going to have a hard time finding evidence for that specific assertion, I think. But maybe that's your assertion. So that you could maybe give some context about what what's happening in Haiti, uh, what's going on. Make your assertion, and the rest of the paper would then um, make your case. So the context then should not be making the case for you necessarily. It might tie into it, but uh, that would kind of explain why we care about this assertion rather than support it directly. So, maybe I'll say why we care. And then the, the evidence then is really supporting your point. You looked into some research, you maybe looked at several different critical reviews and people measured the evilness of these workers and they all found them to be very evil and so that that's your evidence, right? Um, totally baloney story there. Okay, um, at minimum, and I kind of say that, um, I, I'm skipped ahead a little bit. Okay, so then that's your assertion, but then in kind of the wider context, what is your narrative? So a narrative then, you can make an assertion, or maybe you can make multiple assertions in a given narrative. If you think about a good movie or something, you have a narrative, like right? something happening and even in movies, you'll see a very common um, structure that I'm going to I'm going to show you in a moment. And you're going to have 
some sort of a problem and a challenge or, or challenge, context to it, why we care about it, and then some possible resolution or uh, some something about the resolution, right? Maybe it's a hopeful resolution, maybe it's a complete res resolution, maybe it's a direction to one day have a resolution for this topic, or maybe everybody dies and it's sad that that is the resolution of the movie, you know, what, whatever the case may be. So, um, that simplest narrative form, which again, your, your entire, your research paper should have some kind of a narrative, and it's going to incorporate that um, assertion and evidence into it. So the, uh, the simplest narrative form would be something like, and, but, therefore. And I say that meaning we have some sort of a context, and maybe a little more context, but there's a problem or a challenge, therefore we have some resolution, conclusion, uh, some, something coming out um, that's meaningful. If I were really, uh, if I were really crafting my slides well, each of my slides would probably have a little bit of that narrative as well. Uh, I could at least have an assertion evidence where maybe I, I could put my assertion up here in my title. I don't really do a great job of this when I'm lecturing, but if I'm preparing a, a research presentation, a lot of times I try to do that. Um, and then the, the data that I present on the slide will be the evidence there. Lecturing is a little bit different. It's, I, you know, it's hard to say exactly the difference, but anyway, it's somewhere in there. Um, okay, so then the, the narrative here, you could have that in one paragraph, perhaps. You should definitely have it throughout all the paragraphs tied together. Maybe you have an assertion evidence in each paragraph and in the wider system, it's creating some narrative. Okay, so let's make something up. Um, and I need your engagement here. So uh, I need some random, I think I heard my phone ring, so we'll, we'll say that. Um, we'll say Snow's phone ring in class. Maybe that was one of yours, or maybe I just imagined it. But it's, it's a, good, uh, a good start to a narrative. Okay, and what? What happens next? We're, make, we're telling a story. Don't be too weird, but it can be anything. And he answered it, okay. I don't know why I capitalized that. But, what happened next? What was the problem? It, it was a spam call. Or And therefore, what did you guys do? Or what did I do? Or what, what entertaining resolution happened next? I love it. Therefore, <laughs> he threw it across the room and I accidentally hit a student. No. Uh, <laughs> okay. So I had no, I had no intention of what, what to write here, but you see, we just made a story, right? Um, and it may or may not have included my phone uh, being busted into pieces. Um, but that was at least something interesting, right? We actually made some, somewhat of an interesting story, very small level of interest probably, but it was a story, it was a narrative, right? So it's a very uh, useful thing to keep in mind, this and, but, therefore. And you can, you can tell, you could make a, you could include the assertion evidence into that structure if you start thinking about your, um, your writing. Okay, so it might be something worth, worth uh, playing at, considering maybe outlining your, your research paper with that in mind. Okay, uh, so that's kind of the big picture for writing any questions, comments on that? You find that helpful? Awesome. Okay, so next I want to work on EndNote, and um, I had it up before my computer crashed earlier, so let me pull up my, pull up this again. 
Um, so I had an old version of EndNote installed. I'm going to do this live with you right now just to partly walk you through it and also so that I can be sure I have the, the correct EndNote version um, that you'll probably download. So I just uninstalled it before class. So if you go to my LSU and go to Computing Services, you can go to the um, Tigerware. And essentially you just want to search for EndNote. Again, if you want to use some other reference software management system, by all means go for it. This is the one I happen to have expertise with or experience with, so <coughs> that's what I'm going to show you. So it'll bring up this, you click details, you probably have downloaded stuff from here before, I would bet. If you haven't, I would check it out at least for this because it's free stuff. Got to log in to download. And then you can get um, whatever version you need, Mac or Windows. Um, EndNote 20 is what I'm downloading. I was on EndNote 8, I believe. And so there was a few format issues and I've just been working on updating all my computers. So we're going to do that. Download it. Okay, so it's asking for a product key. Fortunately, when you when you enter it here, it's going to have that for you. So, hopefully, shouldn't be too much of an issue here. So you just gotta click through all this stuff. Be good in a moment. So now I have a note, uh, presumably. It has some sort of browser extension capability, so you could tie it into your searching uh, for research articles on the web. I haven't messed with that yet, so I'm not going to delve into that. You guys have have it getting it installed? Any issues? Okay, so I'm going to pull up a proposal I've been working on just to show you. Actually, this is EndNote wants to update before I uh, before I show you stuff. So yeah, I think you have to have Word closed before you do any of that. So one moment. Do you have to have Word open on your desktop, or do you get EndNote also work like if you're on uh, on the Outlook. on that Outlook like the cloud thing? Yeah. Uh, that's a very good question. I'm not sure if it, if you have to have a desktop version installed. I haven't really used it through the online system very much because I always get annoyed with it. <laughs> so I, it might, it might work with the, uh, the 365 kind of through the web, but I'm not sure. All right. Hopefully, I'll have a note up. Yes. Okay. So. Now I have an EndNote, EndNote library pulled up. Um, 
I can also maybe make a new one so just to show you filling out a new one if you need. I think we did this last time, but we'll just do a have an extra one here. Okay, so with EndNote 20, um, each each library is going to pull up in a different tab. Each library file, by the way, has a separate folder associated with it. You can download the uh, actual paper files into there if you want. Okay, so with that, okay, so that that I just opened in note, and then I um, I also then did I went to file and made a new. I just hit new for a new um, EndNote library. And then of course you can save that as whatever you like once you put stuff in. Okay, uh, I'm gonna pull up Web of Science here. So actually what I'll do, so my, re my general recommendation for you for where to do your research, generally to start with, I mean, you can do some Googling obviously, but then when you really want to find references for specific topics, what I recommend is coming to the LSU libraries, going to databases, and going to the web of knowledge, or web of science. So that's my, my choice, my favorite. I have to log in, of course. And it's a good search tool for specifically scientific literature. It's going to give me all sorts of introduction stuff. So, for example, just yesterday I was trying to find out if I could find a specific type of membrane to put in my proposal. I was we're proposing to do this cool virus detection thing and uh, to take a look to see if we can use this fancy spec spectroscopy technique. And we were proposing we'll catch the viruses with a membrane and then do that spectroscopy through the membrane. So we need a transparent membrane. And I know it's like membranes tend to not, like if you get thin polymer membranes, they tend to be kind of see-through or clear, um, or you can imagine they would be. And yes, it turns out some are made that way, but I was having trouble finding them with small enough pore sizes. I needed, I need something that would catch a virus. Um, so something like 100 kilodaltons, which is like 20, 10 to 20 nanometers pore size. Um, but all I could find commercially available were these 0.4 micrometers, so 400 nanometers, and my 30 nanometer virus is just going to pass right through that. So I just found something, but I really needed to search for something more. So I could search for transparent membrane, um, and I could also add in here ultra filtration, but maybe, maybe I don't want to exclude ultra filter. And so what I could do is put ultra F and put an asterisk, and that'll include ultra filtration, that'll include ultra, ultra filter, all that stuff. I hit search, and I've got 119 results. Now, a lot of times when I'm doing a search like this, maybe I want to find very specifically the most relevant things, and it's automatically sorting by relevant, so the most keyword hits. <coughs> So that's maybe a, a good way for me to uh, to look for it. <coughs> it looks like this first entry is filtration of some sort of transparent particles. So that's not not really useful. <coughs> maybe instead of just finding that's the closest match, maybe what I want is to see which article in the literature has had the most impact. So which has been like the most foundational or fundamental article, research topic, maybe that first discovered this new thing that I'm talking about. So then what I would probably do is I would cite from how many times it's been cited. And I want to see um, highest amount of citations first. So a lot of times I'll sort that way. And you see this particular paper, the origin of fluorescence from graphene oxide, has been cited 423 times, um, which is actually quite a lot. That means over 400 other researchers found information in this paper to be so useful that they cited it in their work. Um, so that's 
that's a lot of times how we measure the, the impact, and that's in 10 years, by the way, because that was published in 2012. If you get a paper on the very basics of ozonation that was published in 1920, that probably has a lot of citations because it's been around for so long and it was really the first thing. If you have something like that that's been around 10 years and been cited quite a lot, that's something, you know, that's uh, impressive. Okay, so I can search that way. As I'm searching, whatever I decide, maybe, maybe I think this one perhaps is a good one, and click on it, and let's say I want this in my EndNote library. So here, I could go to export. There is some sort of EndNote online. I've not played with that, feel free. Uh, maybe that one ties in with the uh, online word better, or I think that's just kind of an online library where it keeps your library and does most of what EndNote does. I almost always use the desktop version, and so you can send um, the author title source. That gives you just the generic reference information. I like to send the abstract to, or usually I'll just hit full record to make sure it has all the little fields in case I need it. But I like to have the abstract in there so that when I'm searching, let's go ahead and export. I'll let it open, and it should probably default um, to open with that. You might have to find it on your computer and then manually open it depending on your settings. Um, but once it's here, then you can take a look at the uh, this reference. And I think there should be there should be a way to view the um, oh here it is. Okay, so adjusting that window a little bit, now I can see if I if I want to, I can go through and read the abstract from inside my EndNote. I, I like that because with my you know with one of my EndNote libraries, I try to I have one that I collect just anything I've ever looked at that was meaningful. So I have like hundreds of files in that one thing, and so then maybe I'll go search through that and then read the abstracts to see okay what's going on. Uh, you might want to do that as well. Um, a lot of times the export, if you export it from a just the journal website itself, it'll probably include that. Uh, but just so you know, that's, that's there, that's present. That doesn't mean the abstract's going into your reference list at the end, unless you tell it to. Um, but that's, that's one way to get these citations into your EndNote file. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you another way. And I'm going to close this one for the moment. So I have another EndNote library that I'm working with uh, my colleague right now. And essentially, uh, what I noticed is he gave me some revisions last night and asked me to add in one of the papers. So I'm going to go through that and do that live with you just so we can see um, how that works. got this. Um, and by the way, if you've never used the Microsoft Word Track Changes feature, um, I will be using that to edit your papers. Uh, at least the comments, maybe sometimes I would, you know, if I were to work with you directly to improve something that you wrote, and I was like spending the time to actually fill in the writing myself, what I would do is you can go to review um, and then track changes. Select track changes, then when you you delete something, it shows that that spot has been deleted. And then whoever I'm working with can then go through and accept or reject that change and say, yeah, I like that, or no, I, uh, I didn't like that so much, so I'm going to reject that change. So reject that deletion, for example. Um, it's also pretty common to make comments. Um, and so here I noticed he gave me a link to a paper for a citation there. Um, and so later today when I when I work on this, this is exactly what I'm going to do. I'll just go ahead and download it right now. There are two birds with one stone here. And so I pull up that link that he gave, and it brings me to the paper on some sort of web page. Right? So this is the uh, uh, 
Chemical Society Reviews. This is a Royal S Society of Chemistry publication. Um, and so I could potentially access the article here. Presumably, my colleague's already done the research and wants to put that reference in there, and I'm just kind of dealing with the citation management here. And so I don't think I have to look at it myself. So what I'm going to do is just find the spot to download the citation. It's a little bit annoying that every individual publisher has their own website structure, but just about all of them will have some sort of a citation export um, somewhere. Another reason you might want to use the uh, Web of Science is it's always in that spot, <laughs> right? You can always figure that out a little easier. Um, but you should be able to find it. A lot of these will have EndNote or different little things. A lot of times, the EndNote can recognize a more generic form of a, a file, citation file, because they're not that complex. So I could, it probably would recognize it if I did a bibtex. I'm, I'm not sure, but um, at any rate, we'll go with this. I hit go, and it pops up a download. If you don't have it, you know, if you were to just save it somewhere, then you have to go to that somewhere and open it, um, tell it to open with. EndNote, or I guess this uh, research soft export helper is, is the, the thing. If you have it, issues there, you can definitely, um, uh, you should be able to find instructions on EndNote, how to open those or what programs to use, but really most of that should be default there in place. Okay, so then now I have this new citation, and apparently what I need to do is insert it into that specific spot. So he added a bunch of text that I'm going to go through and uh, accept later and kind of read through it. And he wants that spot to be referenced for this. Um, and so I'm checking and I say, okay, well, that's the spot I want it. So I'm going to put my cursor right there and then come back to my EndNote file and literally just highlight that and then click the little quote. So that's going to send it into the program. except that it didn't work because um, might be a track to change issue the stop track. Okay. Yeah, so the track changes, sometimes it causes some issues. And we see here, it didn't really re um, format it appropriately. Most of my, most of our references, well, they should be showing as numerals, like right here. And that's just the style we selected. And so that's what I'm expecting EndNote to do for me. And it's being a little fussy, probably because I just downloaded it. Um, one thing you can do is if you right click on it on the reference itself, OK. Sometimes you can uh, toggle field codes that way. I'm just going to update citations and bibliography. So there's, EndNote will have a specific tab here, all on its own, um, for that. So you yeah, EndNote update, and that should clear up that issue. There we go. So that's number 25. And if we go all the way to the end where we have the references, you'll see um, the one we just took from the website is now here and listed in line. OK, so very useful. Um, use it all the time. Happy to help a little more with that later. Um, one last thing I'd like to say, if you are graduating and thinking about grad school, I am probably going to hire somebody for a master's and somebody for a PhD in the fall. So if that's something you're interested in, water research technologies, do let me know. Okay, have a good day. See you on Wednesday.